Hello all and welcome to the inaugural seminar of our new flagship centre series hosted by the Daffodil Centre at the University of Sydney and Cancer Council, New South Wales. So I'm Karen Campbell, the Director of the Centre, and I'd like to thank all our presenters today and our Deputy Director, Professor Anne Cust, and I'll be facilitating today. So I'd like to start off by acknowledging the country that the Daffodil Centre founding institutions, the University of Sydney and Cancer Council New South Wales are both built on and, and to therefore acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, both past, present and emerging and offer my acknowledgement and respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may be present today. I'd also like to welcome all our international speakers and attendees as well. Thank you so much for attending our event today. So in terms of housekeeping, we are going to run through all of the presentations first, but you're welcome to pop questions into the Q&A. And at the end, we're going to have a panel discussion. Now this is an international focus, but in our panel discussion, we will be focusing on some of the implications, not only globally, but also in high income countries and in Australia in particular. So feel free to pop questions into the Q&A as we proceed and we'll try and address those at the panel at the end. So before we start, just to give you a brief overview of the Daffodil Centre and this seminar series. So the Daffodil Centre was officially launched on the 30th of March this year and it brings together the strengths of both the University of Sydney and Cancer Council New South Wales aiming to make a substantial impact in cancer control. So the centre's research supports uh, decision making in cancer control and policy and our flagship seminar series is an initiative to bring together international experts in the field of cancer control to discuss critically important and internationally relevant issues. So today's seminar focuses, of course, on a very important current and relevant topic, the impact of COVID-19 on cancer and emerging results from work done through the COVID and Cancer Global Modelling Consortium. So in order to launch our seminar series, I'm so delighted to be able to introduce to you Dr. Elizabeth Vidapas, who is the director of the International Agency of Research on Cancer. We're incredibly privileged to have her with us today to give us the opening address. Um, Elizabeth is a cancer researcher with expertise in cancer epidemi epidemiology and prevention and was appointed as director of IARC in January 2019. So I'm thrilled to have the privilege of introducing her and Elizabeth is going to kick us off and launch the seminar series. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Karen. I hope you can see my slides and, and that you can hear me well. So dear participants, colleagues, friends, collaborators, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. I would first like to thank Prof Professor Karen Kampfel for inviting me to give this inaugural flagship seminar of the Daffodil Center. I will be briefly presenting the International Agency for Research on Cancer's mission uh, which is Cancer Research for Cancer Prevention, and how IARC and Daffodil Center can both benefit from the power of international collaboration through open science. I will start by saying a few words about IARC and its mission and activities. IARC has a unique dual position as an independent International Cancer Research Institute and as the specialized cancer research agency of the World Health Organization within the United Nations system. IARC was established in 65 with the aim of promoting international collaboration in cancer research. From its inception, the role was to foster global collaborations with active participation of states such as Australia, which is one of our participating states, of course. Initially, we were established by seven countries, but since then we have grown to 27 countries around the table discussing science. 
So in short, our mission is, among others, to plan, coordinate and develop research into all causes, treatment and prevention of cancer, collect and disseminate information about cancer epidemiology, causation and prevention throughout the world, and conduct studies of, on the natural history of cancer and provide education and training of personnel involved in cancer research. IARC and the World Health Organization have complementary roles. IARC conducts research that provides the scientific evidence base for the development of cancer prevention and control policies. And WHO then translates the scientific evidence into guidelines and policies to support the implementation of effective public health programs at country level. To fulfill its mission, IARC has developed a new medium-term strategy, which will guide us in the next five years. We live in a very fast-changing world, so we have to forge our scientific strategy to optimize IARC's public health impact and position us within the global uh, cancer community. We are considering the following priorities or fundamental priorities and or emerging priorities. So the fundamental priorities are to monitor the, the global cancer burden, to conduct research to understand the causes of cancer or etiological research, and then to evaluate and implement preventive interventions, providing independent scientific evidence base of cancer risk factors on which decision makers at the national and international levels can develop policies for effective prevention and early detection measures, and then contribute to improving the global health by generating scientific knowledge about cancer and by making this knowledge widely available to partners, experts, and policymakers. We also will be working with three emerging priorities, and these are evolving cancer risk factors and populations in transitions, implementation research, and economic and societal impacts of cancer. As part of its role, IARC provides technical expertise to global initiatives aiming to reduce the burden of cancer. This is one of the meeting points between IARC and the Daffodil Center. We have been collaborating to contribute to the aims of the Global Initiative for Cervical Cancer Elimination that have just celebrated its anniversary a, co a couple of weeks back on the 17th of November. Uh, indeed, in 2018, given the substantial global burden of cervical cancer and increasing inequity, the WHO Director General has made a call for the global action towards the elimination of cervical cancer. And elimination as a public health was defined at, at, as less than four per 100,000 women worldwide. Uh, and there are three intervention strategies that are to be used to, to achieve that. The first is vaccinating 90% of all girls by age 15. Second is screening at least 70% of women twice at the age range of 35 to 45 years. And the third is treating at least 90% of all precancerous lesions detected during screening. In collaboration with researchers globally, including with Daffodil Center, a modeling exercise predicts that implementing this strategy will result in more than 74 million cervical cancer cases averted and more than 62 million women's lives saved over the course of the next century. IARC's collaboration with the Daffodil Center has been ongoing, producing impactful work and informing global strategies for cancer control. We have worked together for many years in important research in cervical cancer, as, as, as I just explained to you. So Fre Dr. Freddie Bray, who will also address this audience later today, and, and Karen, have first set up the collaboration in 2012 
to model the impact of HPV vaccination and cervical cancer. So in this specific work, the two teams come, come together to pull their collective expertise in large-scale data analysis, statistical epidemiology, and predictive mo model. So since that time, IARC and the Daffodil Center team with the WHO and their collaborator, collaborators came to the, together as the CCEMC, Cervical Cancer Elimination Modeling Consortium. And this has really provided extremely useful information for the WHO plan for eliminating cervical cancer. And this work will continue more intensively in the years to come. Karen has also worked with Dr. Beatrice lobby secretan to support the development of the new IARC Handbook for Cancer Prevention on Cervical Cancer in 2021. The Daffodil Center has been actively collaborating also with Dr. Sparta Basso from IARC, Rolando Herrero, Maribel Almonte, uh, all, from, all from IARC, and also with several other colleagues during the past years, and this collaboration is intensified. Our joint engagement has resulted in close working relationships and great mutual respect. Building on this work and extending it, it means that we are ready to come together to form the CCGMC, the COVID-19 and Cancer Global Modeling Consortium, to examine the impact of the crisis on cancer control globally and to support evidence-based decision-making for policymakers worldwide. Today, this consortium has successfully involved over 200 researchers from about 40 countries worldwide. And I'm excited to hear that many important researchers are coming out as uh, research are coming out as a result of this collaboration. I'm really looking forward to listen to the studies that will be presented during this seminar today. And I look forward to the future collaboration with the team at the Daffodil Center. So back to you, Karen, and have an extremely good seminar today. Thank you so much, Dr. Wittepas. We are absolutely honoured to have you open our seminar series and thank you so much. It's, it's been an honour to work with your team as well. So I'm delighted now to tell you a little bit more about the COVID and Cancer Global Modelling Consortium. I'm delighted now to welcome Dr. Freddie Bray, who is the Section Head of Cancer Surveillance at IARC and also my co-chair of the steering group of the CCGMC. And Freddie is well known, I think, to many in this audience. His, his research revolves around the descriptive epidemiology of cancer. And of course, the I, Freddie and his team have um, described the global burden of cancer in detail. So this includes estimations of the global burden, the analysis of time trends of cancer, including predictions of the future scale and profile of, and of cancer and linkages to human development transitions. Freddie, thank you so much for coming today. Over to you. Thank you so much, Professor Canfell. I hope you can see my screen and you can hear me okay. So yeah, once again, thanks for the invite. It's a real pleasure to be part of this inaugural Daffodil Centre flagship seminar. Congratulations to you and the Professor Cuss and the team in establishing this landmark Event. So just some brief words on the CTGMC that has now been introduced by the our director, Dr. Vidopas. Really, this was established, um, I guess, about 18 months ago in the wake of the first wave of the pandemic. And I'm really just introducing the consortium as a, as a segue, I guess, into a number of presentations you're going to hear from colleagues within the consortium. The, the aim from the, the outset of the CCGMC is really and working with founding partners, including the Daffodil Centre and IARC, was to form a coalition of the willing that would connect expert modellers, other discipline experts together in a collaborative effort to develop a global platform for cancer control, as, as already has been stated. And, and indeed, we have incredible representation across many countries. And uh, really, we're bringing the global community together, we think, to support decision making in cancer control beyond the pandemic into the future as we hopefully come out of the of the crisis. So this is, uh, you, you'll be quite familiar with this type of uh, diagram uh, showing at the top the, the new cases and here showing the global 
um, cases um, in 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 worldwide and in France and in Australia. But as, as we know, the pattern of the the pandemic uh, thus far has been a series of COVID nineteen waves, surges in new cases, followed by declines. And as we as we know, also healthcare resources were diverted early in the pandemic to address the the rapidly growing number of cases of COVID-19 to protect healthy people from exposure as well. And with that, non-urgent healthcare was suspended and that had a major impact potentially across the cancer continuum. And of course, subsequently, we know there were delays in cancer screening, diagnosis and treatment due to reduced healthcare access. And with that, there was also a prospect that individuals may delay follow-up of symptoms due to fear of exposure, in the hospital environment, say, or loss of employment if uh, they, they took time off work. Additionally, we, we know that potentially there were behavioural changes that could be adopted during, during uh, the lockdown, for example, um, where weight gain, physical inactivity changes and smoking and alcohol consumption all could have long-term health consequences. So we really wanted to look in, in depth at how, how we could potentially um, explore some of the some of these, these uh, potential consequences of the COVID-19 impact on, on cancer and beyond. So obviously we are the, the branch of cancer surveillance. Uh, Dr. Vidapas has introduced uh, some of the work of the International Agency for Research on Cancer. One of our, our global remits from WHO is to to collaborate with cancer registries worldwide and, and ensure the sustainable, sustainable development in, in low medium income countries. But certainly, and this is, a, I guess, a high income perspective, we know that there, there has been a huge impact on cancer registration itself. The accrual of the number of, of cases has been materially impacted. And here's just some examples from a, a few countries. So when we're thinking about developing a global platform for cancer control, um, we obviously need high quality, timely registry data, essentially by stage, if we're going to better understand uh, the specifics of the of COVID-19 and its impact on outcomes. But there has been a challenge to cancer registries and accruing cases over the last 18 months. And I just give some examples of countries and I won't dwell on this, but even going into the last few months, um, we still see some declines in, in, in some of the major cancers, 17% um, decline uh, in, in cases in, in Quebec, for example, a 25% decline in the Netherlands in the first wave, but still fewer breast and colorectal cancer cases in Australia, in Victoria, um, there's still 10% of, of, of breast and colorectal cancer cases potentially undiagnosed. And this is, this is interesting because it's, it's, it's obviously had a, a huge impact, but it's a good example of how an understanding evolves as the data accumulates and increases in, in granularity are possible. The, the shortfall in the Netherlands could be due to, for example, reluctance of patients to go to the general practitioners, suboptimal diagnostic pathways, or indeed a temporary halt of the, the screening programs. But as the information accrues, you get to know more about what is actually going on. There were indeed several thousand delayed screen detected breast cancers, for example, in the Netherlands, but increasing information suggested that no, no there was no shift towards higher stage breast cancer observed after the restart of the screening program. So it's important to, to, to use the registry information for these purposes, but it, it accrues and we get to understand things much better as, as time goes by. And that, that sort of advertises very much the, the long haul aspects of the, of the consortium. Just as a historical note, it started, I guess, April 2020, part of the COVID-19 and, and Cancer Global Task Force, which had a, a broader remit. This is a task force set up by King's College London and Professor Richard Sullivan, bringing together experts across disciplines around the world to address the concerns with respect to risk uh, related to, to the COVID-19 and its, its suspension of services. So looking at outcomes, but also social inequalities, the impact of research on affordability and so forth. And stemming from that, um, we, we decided that Professor Canfell was really leading on this has from the outset, um, so tribute to, to her and colleagues at the Daffodil Centre, 
really trying to develop a, a platform then to, as has been stated, to deliver some of the activities looking at changes in risk, looking at changes in cancer detection and, and staging, and looking at changes in, in, in cancer outcomes. And this was very much a partnership of uh, the Daffodil Centre of our own agency, but also the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, the International Cancer Screening Network and the, the UICC. So this is just looking at uh, a little bit more depth. You can see the steering committee. Um, there's, there's, there's a number of colleagues within those, those partners that really have uh, driven this, this work, but it's very much a concerted effort. As has been said by Dr. Vaidapas, we have many, many uh, members around the world that signed up to our, our expression of interest and uh, representation of, of, of almost um, 40 countries uh, in, at the present time. And this is just to sort of introduce the, the principles uh, of how we work. So we really, the aim has been to configure modeling platforms and teams that can provide more informed advice to governments as they rise to this uh, health systems challenge. We have a working group looking at quantifying the impacts on outcomes. These are often systematic reviews. Um, there's a working group looking at the, the screening impact across programs, particularly cervix, breast and colorectal cancer and another working group looking at the implementation of things like non, uh, lockdowns, non-pharmaceutical intervention strategies, and how they impacted on, on lifestyle changes. And here you're going to see, uh, as, we, as we move forward in the programme, some, some nice examples across the, the working groups from Julia, Talia, Karen and Kate, uh, from Iris, uh, Elen Eleonora and Isabel and Peter, just giving some, some uh, specific examples across the cancer continuum where we have been working, uh, really trying to show the impact on, on cancer risk, the impact of disruption on cancer screening programs, the potential impact on elimination of cervical cancer and the potential impact of uh, COVID-19 on, on, on projected uh, outcomes and, and, and future treatment disruptions. So this is my last slide, I think. Um, I'm gonna skip that one um, just to, I think this is the exciting aspect to me uh, looking looking forward. I mean, we really want to develop a, a, and curate a dynamic evidence-based assessment tool that, that systematically maps across all policy responses and enables us to, to, to examine together, um, including uh, policymakers, to un better understand their, in their own countries and globally the impact of COVID-19 on cancer-related services and outcomes. So the, the principle here is to, to develop um, what we describe as a COVID-19 and cancer global observatory, a live evidence base, a living systematic review to inform the development um, of the observatory itself and the platform. Um, other projects can come in as, as an ongoing synthesis as the evidence expands. It will contain in-depth critical assessments of the evidence, hopefully it will provide information that can inform better recovery strategies as, as we move forward and also ensure global equity that no one's left behind so that there, there will be an increasing focus on transitioning countries. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much again, Professor Canfell, for the, for the invite. Um, I, I look forward to the, the Q&A, but thanks again. Thank you so much, Dr. Bray. Um, it's, it's absolutely fantastic that you set the scene in this way. And as you've said, we're now going to move to a series of important snapshots of some of the results coming out of the different working groups of the consortium. So without further ado, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Isabel Sajoramataram from IARC and Dr. Peter Sarich from the Daffodil Centre, who will talk to us about some work that's been happening in the um, what we call working group three on prevention on COVID-19 impact on cancer risk, uh, focusing on a review of smoking behavioral changes. So Isabel is the deputy branch head of cancer surveillance at IARC with research interests in descriptive cancer epidemiology, health impact assessment and multiple cancer types. Peter is a postdoc research fellow uh, at the Daffodil with a research interest in cancer prevention He's previously worked extensively on the relationship between alcohol and tobacco, smoking and cancer risk, and has been closely involved in the work of the consortium. Thank you so much, Isabel and Peter, over to you. Good morning, 
Good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Thank you again for uh, inviting us uh, into this exciting uh, webinar. I will then together with Peter uh, present the work that we've done uh, in the last uh, two years, almost two years now on tobacco smoking changes. So this is part of the working group three, which is then one of the working group in um, within then the CCGMC, within the whole consortium, which focuses on uh, prevention. And then we took then the step to selecting one of then the risk factors that's very important in the cause uh, of cancer, which is then tobacco smoking. Uh, Peter, next slide, please. The work itself is done really uh, with a large group of collaboration, uh, collaborators. Um, but as we all know that cancer has a, a large component of prevention on it, 40% uh, of all new cancer cases are caused by known risk factors. Of course, this is different in every country, uh, depending on the different risk factors itself. But tobacco smoking remains one of the most important cancer causes globally. And then during the COVID-19, as we all have witnessed, witnessed it, witnessed it ourselves, uh, governments, nations, countries, uh, states or jurisdictions um, have taken uh, measures to control COVID-19 itself, for example, then through lockdowns um, that at the beginning has been, uh, as Freddie has mentioned, has shown an impact on cancer registries, on cancer diagnosis, delays and disruptions in healthcare sy systems. But then we also uh, suspect, suspected or expected that it may also impact behaviors and then uh, risk factors of cancers, especially then here we were looking into assessing the impact on tobacco, uh, tobacco smoking. And then because tobacco smoking is such an important cause of uh, cancer, uh, our knowledge on whether then smoking uh, changes during co COVID has happened would be then really important to inform preventive measures in different countries. So then there is no long term causes of cancer in cancer burden. So then the aim of this first work is then to look uh, to do a systematic review and then at the end perform a meta analysis to see then uh, whether there was really a smoking behavior changes. What we meant by smoking behavior changes is then the proportion of the population who smoke uh, or stop smoking, but also then the differences in smoking behavior itself. Uh, for example, whether people are more likely to quit smoking or whether people are more likely likely to start smoking, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, next slide, please. So in terms of the method, uh, we looked into all literature, so uh, scientific literature until November last year, so November 2020. We included all studies in all these uh, databases that, is, that are mentioned here. And then as we all know, the preprints has become an important source of information. So we included also then preprint articles in our literature uh, review. Uh, the population that we're including are general population as a whole, but we also included studies that then focuses among smokers. So smokers meaning people who are still smoking, but also those who stop smoking or who are uh, never smokers. What we meant by exposure is then COVID-19 pandemic, and we only included studies that have comparators uh, with the smoking behavior before the COVID-19 pandemic. As I mentioned before, in terms of outcome, what we are looking for, uh, for in these articles are changes in tobacco smoking, so meaning that the prevalence itself, the proportion of, of population who are smokers, but we are looking also in terms of intensity, how many cigarettes are smoked. Uh, whether there is then changes in the smoking behavior itself, so whether people are then more likely to initiate or uh, start smoking or stop smoking, increasing or decreasing their intensity. And then we were also then looking into then the intention to quit smoking during the pandemic. 
we included all different kinds of studies. So cohort, uh, but control and uncontrolled studies, before and after studies, and also cross-sectional studies. I think one of the most important part of a lot of, of this work is that we, we did a really good risk of bias assessments. So we used then two uh, risk of bias tools. So the first then for cross-sectional studies, we used then the Rob Robin's eyes. And then for the cohort or before and after study, uh, we then created also um, a tool, it's not created, it's based then on validated tools, where then we adapted and then uh, perform train series. So then uh, this risk of bias assessment tool can be done uh, as, compar uh, as comparable as possible. So the meta-analysis and the literature uh, systematic review has been then also put into Prospero, for which information is then available here. Next slides, please. So just a little bit on what we have included. So only then including 10 months of uh, studies, uh, we identified around 18,000 studies to be included. There are some du duplicates, but not that much actually. So at the end, as team, as a group, we uh, screened 17,000 papers. Uh, for which at the end we included 33 studies and then we also then performed uh, identification of those uh, references within uh, the studies that we included. So overall, as mentioned, we had uh, included then 33 studies for which then now Peter will then present some of then the major main results. Peter, please. Thanks, Isabel. So um, here's a little summary table uh, that shows each of the um, outcomes that we were able to perform a meta-analysis for. So first of all, um, sort of the headline figure is the smoking prevalence ratio. So it, it, in 12 studies containing 125,000 participants, the pooled prevalence ratio for smoking for during the pandemic versus before was 0 0.87, so that means um, overall about a 13% um, decrease in prevalence among smokers. Um, and then we have other outcomes among smokers only. So um, about 22% of participants reported smoking less, 26% reported smoking more, which is slightly higher, and also 50% um, reported unchanged smoking uh, behavior. And um, of smokers, 4% uh, reported stopping smoking uh, during the pandemic. And then finally, um, in the studies that looked at non-smokers only, um, it was found that 2% um, of participants reported starting smoking. And uh, heterogeneity was high in um, all of the meta-analyses as well, as you can see on the right. Uh, here's just an example of one of the figures. So this is the prevalence, uh, the full prevalence ratio of smoking during versus before the pandemic. So you can see there is quite large heterogeneity, different studies around the world have found different results. And the diamond at the bottom just shows the overall um, prevalence ratio of 0.87. Next, these are the results for smoking less among smokers. And it was found that, as you can see in the diamond at the bottom, 22% of smokers reported smoking less, with um, again, with wide heterogeneity between studies. And um, yeah, similar picture, slightly higher proportion smoking more, so 26%. And again, uh, lots of variation from study to study. And uh, overall, so this is the first systematic review of smoking changes during the COVID-19 pandemic and captures studies published within the, within the early months of the outbreak. Smoking behaviour changes during uh, the early phases of the COVID-19 pandemic were highly heterogeneous, as we've seen. Uh, the meta-analysis indicated a slightly lower overall smoking prevalence during the pandemic. Approximately 50% of smokers did not change their smoking habits, but the proportion of smokers who smoked more, 26% was a little bit higher than the proportion who smoked less, 22%. 
We didn't have enough studies, though, to look at subgroup analyses by um, like factors of interest, like sex or age. So these were only the um, results for all participants. Uh, the scope of this review focused on a population on population level changes and not on specific targeted groups that are known to be at high risk. And finally, updates of this review are planned to assess longer term changes during the pandemic and to consolidate high quality evidence from representative surveys. Uh, thank you and uh, back to Karen now. Thank you so much, Isabel and Peter. And that's, a, I, I guess, a, a very succinct snapshot of a huge project. So congratulations to you. So we'd now like to move on and give you a snapshot of some of the work being going on to quantify the impact of screening disruptions. And in fact, the consortium has been looking at this across different types of screening programs, particularly obviously in high income countries. So cervical screening disruptions, uh, uh, breast screening disruptions and colorectal cancer screening disruptions. And we're going to hear today about disruptions to colorectal cancer or bowel screening as an example. So I'm delighted to introduce Associate Professor Iris Lansdok Vogeloyer and Dr. Eleonora Valletto. So Iris is from Erasmus University Medical Center in the Netherlands and Eleonora is at the Daffodil Center. And they'll be telling us about COVID impact on cancer screening programs using colorectal cancer as an example. Iris is head of the research section on evaluation of screening for GI disorders at Erasmus and her research interests include optimizing colorectal cancer screening, targeted cancer, colorectal cancer screening and surveillance, trends and disparities in incidence and mortality and model development validity and transparency. Eleonora is a senior research fellow and leads the gastrointestinal cancers policy and evaluation stream of research at Daffodil. And her research interests include the areas of cancer control, environmental risk factors for cancer, and the implementation of health services in practice and healthcare system sustainability. So just to note that Iris's presentation is in fact pre-recorded, but she will be joining us for the panel dis discussion shortly. Thank you, Iris and Eleonora, over to you. Good morning, my name is Iris Lonstorp and I'm an Associate Professor at the Department of Public Health of Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today on the impact of COVID-19 on colorectal cancer screening, a global modeling perspective. I apologize that this is a pre-recorded lecture and that I cannot attend the meeting in person. As we all know, COVID-19 hit the world hard and also colorectal cancer screening programs. An informal survey by my colleague, Stephen Halloran from the UK identified that 23 out of the 28 surveyed programs had actually had to suspend their screening programs. In addition, also programs that did not have to suspend also suffered from either a lower capacity from screening and or a lower participation rate. And this raised questions about how we could best mitigate the long-term impact of these disruptions and the impact of the pandemic. And that is where the, cholera, the COVID and Cancer Global Modeling Consortium came into place. Specifically, the Colorectal Cancer Screening Working Group from this consortium aimed to evaluate the impact of disruptions to colorectal cancer screening during the COVID-19 pandemic. Specifically looking at the impact of complete suspension of screening for 3, 6 or 12 months and possible reductions to screening participation after disruption. Finally, the consortium looked at possible catch-up screening for people who had missed screening due to COVID-19. We evaluated these questions using four microsimulation models for three countries in the world. The ASCA and Miskan colon model for the Netherlands, the Oncosim model for Canada, and finally the Policy One Bowel uh, model for Australia. This slide shows the results of that first analysis. On the left-hand side, you see the additional colorectal cancer cases that occurred between 2020 and 2050 due to the disruption of the screening programs. On the right-hand side, you see a similar thing, but then for the colorectal cancer-related deaths. What you can clearly see from these figures for all four models is that the longer the disruption period, so in orange you see three months disruption, and in gray you see 12 months disruption, the more excess incidence cases and the more excess deaths 
will occur because of the disruption. And if we look on a little bit further and we compare a six month disruption with a six month disruption with also reduced participation for six months after the disruption, which you can see here in the light blue bar, then you see that the impact of the disruption and of COVID-19 could actually be even larger, almost double according to some models. However, there's also some good news because there's actually three bars for every model in these graphs. But for most models, the third bar, where you have a six month disruption, but you immediately catch up the missed individuals after that disruption, there actually is no change in colorectal cancers and colorectal cancer related deaths, indicating that you can completely mitigate the long term impact of these disruptions as long as you're able to catch up people uh, sufficiently soon. So the take home messages from this analysis that if you want to mitigate the impact of disruption of screening programs, it is very important to keep the disruption as short as possible, to catch up screening uh, wherever possible and to make sure that you do it as soon as possible and to try and facilitate and promote participation to screening after disruption to make sure that people keep participating in screening. And then, of course, it's important to, to look at whether we are able to provide that catch-up screening. And that is what uh, Eleonora will now uh, present on. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning. My name Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Uh, it's now my pleasure to present to you on the next slide, our second CCGMC project and some Australian work in colorectal cancer screening. The aim of project two was to better understand how catch up screening would affect colonoscopy services, which require careful planning to ensure anyone who has blood detected in their stool is able to access a colonoscopy. We evaluated strategies to catch up a three month disruption by modifying two things. The length of time over which people who missed a screening test were eventually screened, the catch up period, and the fit threshold, which is the level of blood in the stool, which would put someone into a category for further investigation by a colonoscopy. We did this using four models and evaluated the three progr uh, the programs in three countries, as Iris mentioned. On the next slide, you'll see the results for, the Austra for Australia across three time periods and across six different fit thresholds. On the left is the monthly change in colonoscopy demand. And the, on the right is the total number of excess colorectal cancer deaths in 2020 to 2050 that can be prevented by performing catch-up screening. The lightest gray bar corresponds to screening at the regular, regular threshold, the darkest bar at the highest threshold. In red, we can see that if the regular fit threshold is maintained, almost all excess deaths can be prevented, uh, but up to 50% more colonoscopy capacity would be required. In practice, colonoscopy supply can't be instantly ramped up. So in this case, a longer recovery period would minimize the excess deaths. If we click through, we can see that if usual colonoscopy supply cannot be exceeded, just over 50% of the excess, excess deaths could be prevented by increasing the fit threshold. For the other models, a similar trend in result was observed. And on the next slide, you will see the key findings that catch up screening over a 24 month period could avert most excess deaths, and that increasing the fit threshold over a long recovery period could ease the pressure on colonoscopies. Our next endeavour as part of the CCGMC is to estimate the global impact of screening disruptions, and we're hoping to have that results in the first half of next year. The next slide out outlines some of our work in Australia commissioned by the Department of Health on the impact of hypothetical disruptions to the National Bowel Cancer Screening Program. There has been no official pause to the program, but there have been concerns around access, availability and willingness to undertake colonoscopies. And there has been policy interest in understanding the impact on priority populations. 
In brief, we found that changes to colonoscopy follow-up rates would have a significant impact on outcomes and disruptions by priority population group depend on participation, incidence and survival. On the next slide, you'll see where you can find out more information in our publications in Lancet, Gastroenterology and Hepatology, a publication which came out just over the weekend in the Journal of Medical Screening and Public Health Research and Practice, as well as our websites. And finally, on the last slide, I'd like to end by acknowledging the funding for the Australian component of our work and the hard work of all of our colleagues and collaborators in Working Group 2, and a special thank you to Dr Joachim Worthing and Dr. Jabin Liu from the Daffodil Centre. Back to you, Karen. Thank you so much, Iris and Eleonora. And um, I know that there'll be many questions, perhaps particularly about the Australian modelling and the long-term implications, which we'll hold for the panel. And just a reminder to the audience, feel free to enter your Q&As in the Q&A function. We'll be logging those and, and raising them with the panellists later. So I'm now um, excited to introduce you to our next pair of speakers, which will be talking, and, and the next um, topic will be the impact of the crisis on cancer survival and outcomes directly. So next we have Dr. Julia Steinberg from the Daffodil Centre and Dr. Talia Malagon from McGill University. So Julia is a senior research fellow at the Daffodil and her program of research leverages large scale genomic and epidemiological data to gain insights into human health and reduce the burden of cancer. And during the pandemic, um, Julia has been one of our key uh, members at the Daffodil of the CCGMC and she's been leading and helping with many of the systematic review um, processes that have been going on uh, to consolidate um, evidence on multiple topics. Talia is an epidemiologist, modeler and academic associate in the Gerald Boffman Department of Oncology at McGill. And Talia and I first met several years ago in the context also of HPV uh, because she has a research interest in human papillomavirus transmission. But she's also a member of the McGill Task Force on the impact of COVID-19 on cancer control and care, whose goal is to generate evidence to assess the impact of the crisis on cancer services across its network. So again, Talia's presentation is pre-recorded, but she is here and she'll be joining our panel. Thank you, Julia and Talia, over to you. Thank you very much, Karen. I'm delighted to be here and to present our work, which is done by a great collaborative team from the Daffodil Center, IAC and the CCGMC. Early reports during the pandemic suggested people with cancer were at higher risk of both developing COVID-19 and of COVID-19 related death. And while there were concerns about methodological quality of these early studies, they played a critical role in key decisions throughout the pandemic. So it's quite important to assess the strengths and the limitations of that early evidence, which we have done through two systematic reviews. Next slide, please. In particular, we examined the early studies that were published or deposited as a preprint up to the 1st of July 2020, so roughly the first six months of the pandemic. In the first review, we considered the early evidence on whether people with a pre-existing cancer diagnosis have a high risk of contracting the SARS-CoV-2 virus and or of developing the COVID-19 disease. In the second review, we considered the early evidence on whether COVID-19 patients with cancer had a higher risk of death than COVID-19 patients without cancer. Next slide, please. We screened over 10,000 abstracts and over 400 full texts for both reviews. In the interest of time, we'll focus on the risks of COVID-19 related death for the rest of this presentation. For this review, almost 100 studies met the inclusion criteria but actually reported on many of the same patient sample. So our final meta-analysis included data from 54 studies with different meta-analysis for different comparisons. For example, based on how cancer status was defined within studies and which measure of effect was used. Importantly, we found that all these early studies were at high risk of bias. Next slide, please. In particular, very few studies adjusted for the effect of age. So we looked in more detail at six studies that presented odds ratios for COVID-19 related death, both with and without age adjustment. And there was a huge difference in results. Without age adjustment, 
shown on the top half of the figure here, COVID-19 patients with cancer would be estimated to have about 3.3 fold higher odds of death. However, adjusting for age in the same data as shown in the bottom half of the figure, there is still an excess risk of COVID-19 um, related death for people with cancer, but with an odds ratio of only about 1.4. So for the following, we focused our main analysis on 18 of the 54 studies that adjusted for at least age. And while I unfortunately don't have time to show all the details, the pooled adjusted risk estimates from these early studies were overall similar to the adjusted results shown here. Next slide, please. To conclude, the initial evidence on COVID-19 and cancer was characterized by multiple sources of bias and methodological flaws such as small numbers of cancer patients, limited details on cancer status and how it was ascertained, and on other key patient characteristics, as well as overlapping data between studies. Minimally adjusted estimates indicated a higher risk of death for people with cancer based on the early evidence, which since then has been supported by some more recent high quality studies. But going forward, it's important to consolidate high quality evidence on the risks of COVID-19 related death, and in particular, to examine these risks by cancer type, cancer stage, the time since cancer diagnosis, as well as the treatment that people have received for cancer, while adjusting for key patient characteristics such as age, and also more recently COVID-19 vaccination status. Towards this, an update of the review focusing on high quality evidence is currently in progress in collaboration with the WHO, IHAC, and also an um, international team of CCGMC members. More broadly, the insights from the review of the early studies will also inform the establishment of the CCGMC COVID and Cancer Global Observatory platform that Freddie described earlier, which will going forward consolidate high quality evidence and provide timely information to decision makers thus supporting cancer control during the pandemic and subsequent recovery efforts. Thank you very much. Hello and thanks for inviting me to speak here today. I'm going to be providing a high level overview of the projected impact of cancer treatment disruptions in Canada. The COVID-19 pandemic severely disrupted cancer services in Canada. We were less successful at controlling COVID-19 transmission in Canada than in Australia, leading to several waves of hospitalizations that have taxed the healthcare system, especially the provision of surgeries and diagnostic services. We know that cancer outcomes are sensitive to these care delays, and so we have been using decision modeling to predict the long-term impacts of these pandemic care disruptions on cancer outcomes in Canada. To do this, we have developed a microsimulation model of cancer survival program in C++. In the model, new cancer cases are diagnosed over the simulation time with particular sets of characteristics. The cancer care trajectory for each cancer case is simulated until either the person's death or until the end of 2030. The impact of delays is one of the most uncertain parameters when trying to predict the effect that delays will have on cancer mortality. We used estimates from a recent meta-analysis which estimated that each four-week delay in cancer surgery leads to a mortality hazard ratio of 1.06 to 1.08 for many cancer sites. So in a base case scenario, we therefore assume that each four-week delay in diagnosis and treatment for all cancer sites will lead to a 6% increased hazard of cancer mortality. This slide shows the model predictions for the monthly number of new cancer cases and cancer deaths over time in the base case scenario and in a counterfactual scenario with no pandemic. The gray lines represent the predictions for the no pandemic counterfactual. We see that both cancer incidents and deaths are expected to be increasing over time due to population growth and aging. The red line represents the predictions for the base case pandemic scenario. So if we look at cancer incidents, we see two drops in cancer incidents uh, that coincide with the first two pandemic waves in 2020 and 2021 in Canada. However, any missed diagnoses are expected to be eventually caught up during 2021 and 2022. If we look at cancer deaths on the right hand side, the model predicts a small but noticeable increase in cancer deaths, mostly starting from 2021 due to pandemic related delays in cancer care. 
This figure shows the difference in numbers of cancer deaths between the pandemic and, no, and the no pandemic scenarios. And the model predicts that the years with the most excess cancer deaths is likely to be 2022, where a 6% increase in cancer deaths was predicted. So over the next 10 years, if cancer treatment capacity is recovered but not increased in 2021, we could expect around a 2% average increase in cancer mortality over the next 10 years due to pandemic-related cancer care delays in Canada. These predictions assume that cancer treatments return to pan pre-pandemic normal levels in 2021. However, uh, it has been challenging to return to normal in Canada to, to, due to the recurring pandemic waves that we have experienced and due to a nationwide nursing, la nursing labor shortage, which is ongoing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julia and Talia. And now for the final presentation, uh, Dr. Kate Sims and myself are going to give you a bit of a, a joint update on the impact of the crisis on cervical cancer elimination delays. So Kate is um, my co-lead in one of the substreams of work at the Daffodil Centre, um, our LMIC or low and middle income country work, and she's been in our team ever since she was a postdoc. She's incredibly talented. She's been with our team for about 10 years. And her research uh, focuses on modeling the impact of vaccination and screening on cervical cancer outcomes. And she's been involved in a whole range of our model income, um, modeled evaluations across a whole range of settings, including in Australia for the National um, Cervical Screening Program. So I'm going to now just quickly set the scene. Kate um, is first author on this important work that was presented just a couple of weeks ago at the International Papillomavirus Society meeting. And I'm just going to spend a few, um, a couple of minutes setting the scene before she tells us about the impact of the crisis on delays and elimination. Next slide, please, Vashini. So the background, as Dr. Vidavas um, said, is that really this goes back to 2018 when Dr. Tedros, the WHO Director General, called for all countries to take action to help end the suffering caused by cervical cancer. Next slide, please. And as we heard before, the three pillars of cervical cancer control have been defined as 2030 targets. So by that year, the aim is for all countries to have scaled up globally across these three, in fact, very ambitious targets, prophylactic vaccination, 90% of girls fully vaccinated by 15, screening that uh, all adult women are screened a minimum twice in a lifetime with a high precision test, HPV based screening, and treatment. So all women that require treatment for screen detected pre-cancer or for invasive cancer or access to supportive care or palliation are able to access those services. And if this is achieved, the aim is to, next slide please, um, is to achieve rates so low that cervical cancer would be considered to be eliminated as a public health problem. And that's that threshold of four cases per 100,000 women per annum. Next slide please. So the, this has really moved. Unfortunately, the timing of the elimination initiative um, is, is quite coincident with the pandemic. So it was actually February the 4th, 2020, World Cancer Day, that the WHO Executive Board recommended and adopted the strategy for elimination of cervical cancer at the World Health Assembly. And that then led to the launch in November 17th, 2020, of the elimination initiative. And as Dr. Vita Pass said, we've just celebrated one year. Next slide, please. Uh, just to quickly um, sum up some of the modeling behind this. Um, so Daffodil Center modelers had previously estimated that in high income countries, including Australia, elimination at that threshold could be quite um, imminent. And this is um, by Michaela Hall in our group. Um, elimination is possible in high income countries within the next few decades. In Australia, we've put that timing at somewhere in the range 2028 to 2035, um, but that's um, as a population average and unfortunately won't be realized by all groups of women equally. Uh, in, at the global level, working with IARC, we and Kate was first author of this important analysis, the first global analysis uh, that really showed for the first time that you need to combine vaccination and screening and that just considering vaccination uh, would really mean there was an incredible delay in impact. So adding twice lifetime screening of adult women to vaccination of young girls would avert a further 13.4 million cases of cervical cancer over the next half century. 
Next slide, please. This then led to the uh, work that's been spoken about of the WHO Cervical Cancer Elimination Modeling Consortium, the CCEMC, uh, which really looked across 78 LMIC for impact and cost effectiveness modeling. And just briefly, the original modeling of the consortium, which supported the elimination planning, was in accordance with that single model analysis I just showed you. Uh, if vaccination was done alone, uh, then it would reduce over the very long term rates of cervical cancer by about 90% and avert around 61 million cases. But it wouldn't uh, result in elimination over the long term in, um, in at least 40% of LMICs. And so again, it's adding twice lifetime screening, which is needed to both reduce the incidence further, a 97% reduction overall, and also bring forward the benefits because it's addressing the hundreds of millions of women that have already been exposed. And so it would add an extra overall on average across the models that were participating. Um, 12.1 million cases would be averted and that in this way, 100% of LMICs would be able to reach elimination. Next slide, please. So just very briefly, one of the key pillars is the um, screen and treat pillar, pillar two. And it's really important to note that WHO, again, in partnership with IARC and drawing on the handbook of cervical screening, have recently launched new guidelines for HPV screen and treat and screen triage and treat uh, for the general population of women and for women living with HIV. And this is a really important mechanism to promote the use of HPV screening with a self-collection and point of care testing options. And now I'm gonna to hand to Kate, who'll tell us about the implications of the crisis. Thanks, Karen. So Karen's painted a really positive picture of what could happen globally and across low and middle income countries if we could reach these elimination targets. Um, however, COVID-19 is likely to significantly impact many countries' abilities to reach the elimination targets. In particular, um, it's already been noted that there's been disruptions to existing school-based vaccination programs, largely due to school closures in many countries. There's been delays to the initiation of new programs in low middle income countries as these countries turn and face towards managing the more urgent needs of the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition to the program implementation disruptions, there's been disruptions to ongoing key trials, including trials of one dose vaccination, which are really critical to providing evidence that one, all that is required is one dose of HPV vaccines in order to provide good long lasting protection. There's also the potential for the impact of COVID-19 crisis on vaccine hesitancy, and not just COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy, but that hesitancy could um, spread to other vaccines like the HPV vaccine. There's been disruptions to established screening programs in high income countries, and many of this has been reported, and um, some of our modelling estimates for the impact of disruptions on, in cervical screening programs in high income countries has been published. There are supply disruptions impacting the ability to scale up HPV testing in many settings. And of course, disruptions in cancer treatment services as we saw earlier throughout this, um, this seminar. So we therefore aim to quantify the impact of these disruptions on reaching the cervical cancer elimination targets across all 78 low and middle income countries. And we use the three models that form part of the Cervical Cancer Elimination Consortium to perform this um, analysis. So as an example here, I'm showing the schematic of one of the models involved, which is our model policy one cervix at the Daffodil Center. This is a dynamic model of HPV vaccination, HPV transmission and cervical screening. And as a, a key starting scenario or starting assumption, what we did was we assumed a 12 month delay in the scale up of um, reaching the three elimination pillars. So the, the targets across HPV vaccination cervical screening and cancer treatment. And as an initial analysis, it's just a 12 month delay in reaching these targets. So as described in the commentary, which involved Karen Campbell and some of our other collaborators, there are unique challenges to reaching these elimination pillars, um, particularly in the era of COVID-19. Even in the absence of the pandemic, it's estimated that around 342,000 women will die from cervical cancer in a given year. This number represents almost 20% of the total number of COVID-19 deaths that are attributed 
attributed to COVID-19 for the year 2021, according to John Hopkins Coronavirus Resor Resource Centre. Now, the, the predictions from the Cervical Cancer Elimination Modelling Consortium are shown in the table on the right. Across all three pillars, the models estimate that an additional three, that 326,000 deaths will be experienced from just a 12 month delay to scale up of reaching these elimination targets. 147,000 of these additional deaths are predicted to be due to vaccine delays alone, 69,000 due to screening delays and 93,000 due to delays in scale up of cancer treatment access across the 78 low middle income countries. Now, as an exploratory analysis, we use the policy one cervix model to assess what would happen if we had delays to current cervical cancer prevention across the 78 low middle income countries. Because of the limited vaccination and cervical screening that's ongoing in these settings, these delays are assumed to only impact the, the limited amount of cervical cancer treatment that's ongoing in these settings. So delays to the cancer treatment services that are currently available in these settings is predicted to result in an additional 31,000 cervical cancer deaths from just a 12 month delay. This would then be added to the original estimates of 342,000 deaths from cervical cancer in a given year in the absence of the impact of the pandemic. Now, despite these challenges, there are still enormous efforts to continue the elimination agenda. Our previous predictions using the Policy One Cervix model have found that Australia is likely to be the first country to reach elimination. And this is predicted to occur in the next 10 to 15 years, and we're still on track to reaching this. This slide shows, describes a major philanthropic initiative known as the ECCWP. This initiative will support our region in implement, implementing elimination agendas with planning ongoing even in the absence of the pandemic. These agendas are going to be country led from the countries that are in the Pacific. I'd just like to finish by acknowledging um, the other members of the team at um, the Daffodil Centre, some of which are pictured on the right, and it's not an updated photo or, or updated descriptions of the team, but also acknowledge our collaborators, our wider collaborators from the NHMRC, C4, CRE, as well as the other leads for the WHO, Global Cervical Cancer Elimination Modeling Consortium. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate, for bringing us home on a more positive note. So um, we're now going to move to a panel discussion. So I might ask all of our panelists to kindly turn on their cameras. And just a reminder for the audience, um, keep those questions flowing in the Q&A. We've got several questions coming through. So I'd like actually to um, just kick us off. Um, Dr. Vita Pass, um, you know, I think it would be, I suppose, if we just move to the very broadest perspective, um, we know that the crisis has gravely impacted the funding available for cancer research. So I think it's, um, you know, and I think actually I'll ask Freddie as well for his opinion on this if, if Elizabeth has left us, I'm not sure. But um, how do you think that we as cancer researchers can best respond to the funding challenge, which we haven't seen. We've been lucky, I suppose, in Australia, but in many countries worldwide, funds have been severely curtailed for cancer research. So how do you think we can best make the case that the indirect effects of the pandemic on, on cancer are severe and long lasting and that investment into mitigation is critical? So I'll open that up to Dr. Vita Pass if she's here or Freddie, yes. otherwise. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I, I might kick off. I hope you can hear me. So I think there is an urgency to publish all this data that you are producing. I think this consortium is absolutely essential in many ways, but the, 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 the bottom line is that you really quantify in a rather precise way, although you, of course, you have uncertainties here and there, but you give a more precise estimate of the impact of the pandemic COVID-19 
on, on, on all cancer aspects. I mean, from, from cancer registration to prevention, to early diagnosis, to diagnosis and to treatment. And people are not aware of it. Of course, WHO has made some very rough estimates based on, on some questions to ministries of health but it's, uh, it's not precise at all. And I think this data is essential for, for uh, public health officers, ministers of health and governments to plan more accu accurately what they should do to, to, av to avert all this debt. So my, my uh, encouragement to this consortium and also a plea, please publish this as soon as possible. If you cannot publish all papers at once, start publishing then at, at least some highlights in conferences and in seminars, and let's disseminate this as much as we possibly can. From IARC's perspective, of course, Dr. Isabel Soriomataran and Dr. Freddie Bray will pilot the initiative, but we can offer a website for a very wide dissemination in forms of videos or other means to reach the all, all stakeholders. So further to Fred and Isabel, maybe. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Yes, I mean, I, I think um, we are really excited about the potential for the COVID and cancer observatory, aren't we, Freddie? And, and I think we're delighted that we should be getting the first version up and running uh, for some of our results that will give a really nice live resource hosted by IARC. But Freddie, would you like to comment on that topic? And, and I suppose also from your perspective, the importance of not only the work of the consortium, but the, the importance of the data systems that sit behind what modelers can do um, and cancer registration and, and building capacity for that. Freddie, over to you. Thank you, Professor Campo. Yeah, I mean, I, I can only echo what Dr. Feiderpass said. I mean, I think we need to obviously publish these results, but this principle of this observatory is really important. I think we need to create this environment whereby, you know, things can, new evidence emerges, we can put it on the website and, and, and things alter. We, we, as I mentioned in my presentation, even the, the registry data, we didn't know what was happening when you have this 10-20% uh, decline in specific cancer cases, but then you, you begin to understand because you have this stage specific information, uh, you can link that to screening programs and so forth. So, it, it I mean, Certainly from our own perspective, our, our scientific council, our 27 participating states, are incredibly interested in the, the COVID-19 and cancer space and specifically this consortium and the observatory. So I think there's a lot we can do with them and, and potentially also in, the, in the, the principles around fundraising. I mean, in, in terms of cancer data systems, you're absolutely right. I mean, if we're going to understand the potential impact of the suspension of cancer services across the cancer continuum, the bottom line is we need we need to, to assess the, the effect of delay uh, in, in in diagnosis on, on stage, and so that 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 is certainly we need all all forms of cancer surveillance information. But obviously, population-based cancer registries that are mentioned are, are critical because we need to monitor the future incidence and survival, including potential stage migration. So I guess the uh, I mean, they're, they're key to assessing mitigation strategies and the extent to which countries are building back better. But I think the pandemics also serve to, I think, probably possibly hinder cancer registries, or they could be construed as a, a silver lining as well. They're they're asked to perform the basic function, function, but they're also um, having more demands for timely and additional reporting. That's intensified. Um, there needs to be infrastructure for enhanced data collection, high quality studies, and presently. Many are undervalued and, and potentially under-resourced, particularly in low-medium income countries, where we see that you know things like hard lock, lockdown, reduced public transport in sub-Saharan Africa, as an example, in Eastern Africa, curfews and posts, limited access to hospital wards, that has an impact on cancer registration. So I hope a, a silver lining would be that you know the cancer registries are seen as an investment and not a not a cost, and that they they have a huge potential to be used to support medication strategies for this pandemic, but also, of course, for the, the three WHO signature initiatives you mentioned, the, of course, the elimination initiative for cervical cancer, but also, there of course, ones for breast cancer and, and childhood cancer. Back to you. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Freddie, you've been an articulate advocate for investment in these data systems for registration for many years. And, and yes, I, I, I agree with you. It's certainly Speaking from the perspective of the consortium, 
one of the, the, the critical difficulties has really been the timeliness of ob obtaining registry data, particularly from LMIC, but also in fact from high income countries. And then of course, the difficulties of getting information on disruptions themselves and as, as they're actually being reflected in health services at the level of granularity that we need to understand. And of course, this is quite a dynamic crisis, isn't it? So it's really not just about what happened in the early part of 2020. And unfortunately, it may be that we're facing subsequent waves as well. So, so thank you. I think that's a point well taken. I, I might move Isabel and Peter to a specific question that's come through on the chat for you about your presentation on smoking behaviours during the crisis. So um, it's a difficult one to answer but you would be best placed to answer it. So what if any permanent changes to smoking behaviours do you think the pandemic will have? Or do you think that what you've captured in the heterogeneity of the responses is, is probably transient effects? So um, over to, to both of you to, to speculate on that point. So I'll start first, and then I think Peter then can add afterwards. So as you alluded it already, Karen, we found really mixed uh, results. Uh, so there are some people, I mean, some groups smoking more and some groups smoking less. And this is the same as what we saw as well in other reviews that's been done for obesity, for physical inactivity or alcohol drinking. Those are really major causes of cancer. What we don't know yet, uh, we, this is then our next task, is then to look into whether then the changes are long term or not, because all these reviews so far has only looked into then behavioral changes at the beginning of the pandemic. If we are comparing it with other uh, systems, for example, thinking of disruptions and then try then to um, hypot hypothesize from there, it depends a lot, I think, in the health systems, in the preventions, then if we're talking uh, uh, about smoking programs in each countries. If we're looking into then the disruptions for cancer care, some countries, I think all countries, there were dis dis disruptions at the beginning, but at the long term, it depends a lot what countries then done in terms of mitigating the impact. And I can imagine that this will be very similar in terms of cancer prevention as well. So the stronger, the more resilient the health system is, and then the stronger as well than the mitigation that's done in terms of behavioral. If nothing is done, uh, the problem is we know that this will have a really long-term impact because then the risk factors have really 20, 30 years of impact in ter terms of cancer burden. So the, the, the task at the moment is really then to identify uh, where it is exactly and then through the modeling consortium, trying then to look into then um, mitigation strategies based on best practices that we find uh, in different countries globally. Peter, anything to add? I'll just, just echo what you said, Isabel. I think, yeah, most likely what we've captured in our review is um, probably short-term changes in response to like the, the first wave of the COVID pandemic. So I think probably the, the average survey was done probably in April or May 2020. So I think we really need to wait and see those long-running um, time series surveys. Like in Australia, it would be the National Health Survey or the National Drug Strategy Household Survey. Um, to un understand what the long-term um, effects will be. Thank you so much, Isabel and Peter. Peter, uh, perhaps you could comment on what, I mean, obviously we, 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 you presented with a global lens, but what do we know about what's happened with smoking behaviour and exposure to other cancer risk factors like alcohol in Australia so far? So in our meta-analysis, um, there weren't actually any um, yeah, representative surveys conducted in, in Australia. But um, there have been others that have been reported. Um, and for both alcohol and tobacco, it's really been a mixed bag of results with a proportion of people both increasing and decreasing their consumption. So for example, um, both an ABS survey and an Ipsos poll found that a high proportion of participants increased their drinking compared to decreasing. But in, in, a, in an ANU poll, the reverse was found with a high proportion decreasing their drinking. Um, in two of these surveys, though, it was found a high proportion of women compared to men increased their alcohol consumption. 
and the proportion increasing their drinking was high for those aged under 65 and especially it was found for for women aged 35 to 44 whereas for smoking uh, the ABS survey found a high proportion of um, were increasing compared to decreasing their consumption while the Ipsos poll found a high proportion of quitting smoking compared to those initiating and the ANU poll found no significant change in smoking prevalence. Um, and in the ANU poll, we're just breaking it down by age and sex. In the ANU poll, they found a high proportion of women compared to men increased, while a high proportion of those aged under 65 increased compared to those aged over 65. So overall, most surveys have been designed to capture, most of those surveys have been designed to capture short-term changes in health behaviours during the pandemic. Um, and there are breakdowns by sex and age, but um, not many other factors. And the overall picture isn't always consistent. So I think we will need to wait in, um, for those yeah, long running surveys like the National Health Survey for a more conclusive picture on any longer term changes in yeah, for alcohol and tobacco that have occurred during the pandemic. Yeah, thank you so much, Peter. And I think it definitely emphasises the importance of keeping living systematic reviews going to, 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 to um, assimilate this evidence as it emerges. Thank you. Well, I, I'll turn now to Iris if she's here. It's very early in the morning in the Netherlands, but um, Iris, I think, is joining us. And um, she's been a long term advocate for thinking and a researcher in the area of risk based screening. And, um, you know, I guess one of the things we've talked about, Iris, and if she's not here, I'll ask Eleanor the same question. But one of the things that we've talked about, uh, you know, as a team is, is the potential silver lining of a bit of an acceleration towards more tailored screening approaches that are, that are you know tailored more to the risk that an individual is at and you know we've been in effect looking at risk-based approaches in terms of colonoscopy recovery of course now dr karen bartholomew has a specific question about this she says for colonoscopy recovery was consideration to fit testing for symptomatic or diagnostic scopes as a mean of used as it or considered as a means of prioritizing scope capacity such as in the uk trial across diagnosis and screening so i guess that idea that you could use sigmoidoscopy as almost a triage to full colonoscopy i think um, might be the 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 um the idea and i i think eleanor or iris if you'd like to jump in um Yes, so, so uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my, my voice still needs some practice, but I'm sure it gets better uh, along the way. Um, yeah, so uh, that's really an excellent question. It's something that we've discussed within the consortium as well. Um, but we also realized that risk-based strategies um, have a lot more um, uh, additional uh, considerations that still need to be resolved uh, before we can really um, start implementing it right away but i do feel that this crisis and also um additional shortages in uh, colonoscopy capacity that have been uh, existent around the world already could um accelerate this and i i know that there's several initiatives going on in the world of colorectal cancer that um are really working towards risk-based screening. And the example of the UK to mention that it's, it's very good because there it's not so much a risk-based screening approach, but really it is uh, now a, a common um, policy to offer all uh, individuals with symptoms a fit with a very low cutoff. I think the cutoff is maybe 10 or there've even been talks of having a cutoff of any blood in stool. Um, to prioritize colonoscopies. And this way, what you're seeing is that you still find basically all the cancers. So the really people that really need the acute care, you find those, uh, but you can also um, this way preserve some of your capacity for the screening program, because what you see with the screening program, the yield of a colonoscopy after a positive fit is so much higher than the yield of a colonoscopy based on symptoms. And in general, and that makes sense, people tend to prioritize the people with symptoms because they are sick and we need to do something about them. But basically colonoscopy is not always the best answer for these individuals. And by using sort of the fit as a triage, this has really um, been able to free up some of the capacity, especially in the UK where capacity of colonoscopy uh, was already an issue before the crisis. 
and still continue the screening programs this way. So I think, yes, that these are initiatives that um, we as modelers maybe should also be looking at. And that's something that we can, um, uh, using the data from the UK, using our modeling, modeling, we can make projections for other countries to see if that would also work for them. So I agree that this is a good way. And especially now, it seems like this, these waves of COVID will be around for longer than we were hoping for when we all uh, got into the crisis to start with. I think now the time really is to start thinking about how can we prioritize our, um, uh, given that we are in, a, ideally we would just continue as we uh, would before the crisis, but since that's not an option, I think risk-based screening is probably one of the best ways to deal with the shortest capacity and still save the most lives. Yes, absolutely fantastic. And, and we are all trying to stay focused on the silver linings here and that, that I think will be one of them. So unfortunately, I'm very sad that we're almost at time. I'm going to give the last word to Talia with an important question that's been asked. You've obviously done some of the first detailed modelling of the impact of delays to cancer treatment in cancer services in Canada. Talia, what, what do these results mean for Australia and what are the next steps for you? Yeah, so obviously in Canada, we've had more disruptions than Australia, especially at the start. But uh, I do think that we can learn from perhaps comparing what happened uh, in both countries. And so uh, uh, researchers from both of our countries in Australia and Canada have gotten together within the CCGMC to work on a comparative modeling project to look at the combined impact of screening and, uh, and diagnostic disruptions and treatment disruptions in both Australia and Canada. And so we do believe that collaboration can help us to inform the development of the CCGMC global modeling platform. Um, Thank you so much, Talia, and thank you so much to all our panellists. We're gratefully appreciative of the odd hours in your time zones that um, had, have meant that you've joined us in Talia's case in the middle of the night and in the case of our European colleagues early in the morning. But we're, we're very grateful to all the speakers and to the Daffodil Centre team for the important presentations today. Thank you so much to our audience. I'm very sad that we couldn't take um, all, everyone's questions and have a longer discussion but um, we're very grateful. And I would like to just finish as well by acknowledging Vashini Ravi and Madeline Kolb who provided um, amazing technical support to us today. So if you'd like to find out more, um, feel free to head to our website, the daffodilcenter.org at the Sydney University and Cancer Council um, hosted site. And we look forward to um, coming back in the new year with the next in our seminar series. So stay tuned for um, more information on the great international collaborations and um, information on what the Daffodil Centre is doing from next year. Thank you to all.